everyone, and welcome to the ASMR book club. I am very glad that you could be with us today, because today I am starting a new series of videos. In this series, I am going to tell you about awesome women of history. As the title suggests, in these videos, which I'm going to try and do about once a month, I'm going to choose a woman in history uh, whose life I think is uh, interesting or important or just simply very cool. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. I'm going to try and pick women that maybe you haven't heard too much about. first installment, I've chosen someone from the 17th century. So, without further ado, let me tell you about the incredible life of Julie Daubigny. Opera singer, expert swordswoman, genderqueer, bisexual adventurer, Julie Daubigny's life There are a lot of fuzzy details about her life, the exact date and place of her birth, when she died, how she died, and how many of the rumors about her are true. But her life certainly was flamboyant and fascinating. First of all, let's begin with her name. She was born Julie Daubigny, and her married name was Julie Maupin. On stage, she went by Mademoiselle de Maupin, but her fans called her simply La Maupin. Her lovers called her Emily or Julia. When Théophile Gautier wrote a novel based on her life in 1835 called Mademoiselle de Maupin, she was known by that name after that. Nowadays, she's mostly known simply as Julie Daubigny. She was born in France around 1673, the daughter of Gaston Daubigny, the secretary to King Louis XIV's Master of Horses, Count d'Armagnac. The Count d'Armagnac was one of France's great nobles, so Julie was born in a world of grandeur and opulence. It's believed that she spent the first part of her life at the Palais des Tuileries, the uh, Tuileries Palace, then moved to Versailles in 1682. Her father was an expert swordsman. He taught fencing to the court pages. Apparently, her father was not too preoccupied with gender roles because he taught his daughter all he knew about sword fighting, horseback riding, and even gambling. From a very young age, she was excellent at fencing and would often dress in men's clothing. She grew up to be a really striking young woman. She was tall, with sparkling blue eyes and auburn by age 14, she became Count d'Armagnac's mistress. Yes, her father's boss. D'Armagnac promoted her father and found her a husband. Sieur de Maupin, who was very soon sent away from court to be a tax collector. Some people claim that he was sent away the very next day after the wedding. Julie d'Aubigny
afford a living, they would give fencing demonstrations in fairs and taverns. Shirley would often wear man's clothes for these demonstrations, probably for comfort as well as style, but she never tried to hide her gender. One rumor says that a man did not believe that she was a woman, since she was so skilled at fencing. She removed her blouse to prove him wrong to the astonishment of the crowd. The man was apparently convinced. Julie de Montaigne, having a beautiful singing voice, she also sang in taverns to earn some money. Who knows how, but she then began singing at the Marseille Opera. She is said to have had great success early on, being an excellent singer and a convincing actor. She particularly grabbed the attention of a young woman whose identity is not known today, and they became lovers. The girl's family became aware of the Dalians. They were very shocked and sent the girl away to a convent in Avignon. But that would not stop Julie de Maupin. She enrolled in the convent as well as a postulate. One night, Julie stole the body of the dead nun, placed it in the girl's bed, and set fire to the bedroom so they could flee together. They were on the run for three months. Julie failed to show up to court for her crimes, and she was sentenced to death by fire by the parliament in Provence. They sentenced her as Sieur de Maupin since the judges had trouble believing that a woman could have kidnapped another woman from a convent. After three months, the girl decided to return to her family. Julie continued to travel through France dressed in men's clothes. One day, she met a young noble called Count Louis-Joseph d'Albert Luin. D'Albert challenged her to a duel, not knowing she was a woman. She beat him, wounding his shoulder in the challenge. He sent a friend to apologize, and she went to see him. She nursed him back to health, and they began a romance. Certain accounts claim that the Count d'Albert was the love of her life, others that they then became simply lifelong friends. The affair was short-lived, since Dalbert had to return to his military unit. She then began singing lessons with a retired opera singer called Maréchal, and started a new affair with a young singer, Gabriel Vincent de Vénard. Together, they went to Paris, and de Vénard auditioned for the Paris Opera. Julie went to see the Count d'Armagnac and convinced him to help her obtain a pardon from the king for her indiscretions, aka setting fire to a convent and fleeing with a young woman. She actually obtained her pardon. De Vénard was hired by the opera, but he set it as a condition that they would also audition Julie. Of 17, Julie became La Maupin, an admired opera singer in one of the world's most prominent opera houses. She debuted as Palace Athena in Cadmus et Hermione by Jean Baptiste de Lully in 1690 and appeared in major roles there between 1690 and 1691. The Marquis de Tanjou wrote in his journals about her performance in Enfal that La Maupin had the most beautiful voice in the whole world. Her next scandal happened at a court ball, which she attended dressed as a man. She kissed a young woman on the dance floor and was challenged to a duel 
Julie. 